Good evening. Welcome to St Thomas Baptist Church's online service tonight. It's really great to see you all. My name's Matt and just great to have an opportunity to um, spend time listening to God's Word together. Um, so Stephen tonight is going to be continuing his um, series on discipleship and this evening we'll be looking into the subject of evangelism. So pray that you're all keeping uh, safe and well wherever you are. And where we are at the minute is in a very tough and challenging situation. But one thing I always like to do when I'm out preaching anywhere is to start off by reading a psalm. So to prepare us for this evening's service, I thought it would be great to read Psalm 100. So Psalm 100 is a song of praise for the Lord's faithfulness to his people, a psalm of thanksgiving. It says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So on this Sunday evening, as we head into a a week, it might be a working week, it's probably going to be a very different week to what we've um, been used to in the past. But it's just great that we can come around his word, we can just look at his promises and everything in here we know doesn't change and as it says his truth endures to all generations so we have so much to be thankful for tonight. So in a moment Natalie's going to come and bring our reading this evening but first we commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, just the opportunity we have just to take some time out. Lord, to turn away from all of the distractions that are going on around us and just simply focus back in onto your word and your truth. And Lord, as we look into your, your gospel tonight, Lord, we just pray for, for Stephen and what he has prepared. We just pray that what he brings will truly be a challenge or an encouragement to us uh, where we are. And Lord, as we are in these tough times and tough situations, we just pray that you'll be um, with everyone who's watching tonight. You'll be with the friends and families of those in the congregation. And Lord, as we um, are in a situation where the restrictions are slightly different, we just pray for our leaders. Um, we pray for those who um, are working in tricky situations at the moment, such as those in the NHS, and Lord, we lift them up to you this evening. But Lord, we just so know that we have so much to be thankful for, and Lord, we just thank you so much that we can just simply um, take some time out to think of all the amazing things that you've done for us and how much you've blessed us. And Lord, we just pray that this evening's service will be a blessing to people where they are. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good evening everyone. This evening's reading is from Mark 16 verses 14 to 20 and it's entitled The Great Commission. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and they rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will be by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Good evening again and welcome to our continuing series on the subject of discipleship. Thank you for all the words of encouragement that have come through over these last few weeks. And I trust as we study this together, we'll be able to encourage 
and challenge each other as we walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is truth and it's your truth that sets us free. And we pray that as we look into the subject of evangelism tonight, you will help us to be the kind of disciples that we ought to be. Lord, that we will lift up our eyes and see fields white already onto harvest. And Lord, that you will um, help us to um, be faithful in what you've called us to do. So help us this evening, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Over these last few weeks, we've, and looking at the subject of discipleship, we've looked at how to get started. We've looked at the importance of prayer. And we've looked at the importance of God's word. We've also looked at the importance of obedience. And we're going to look tonight at, at one of the one parts of evangelism that most of us find the hardest, if not the most uncomfortable. And you said, well, some of the other stuff has made us feel really uncomfortable as well. So what are we in for? I've said we're looking at the subject of evangelism. And most of us goes, oh, I don't like that. I don't do that. It, it really takes me out of my comfort zone. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, evangelism is simply the spreading of the Christian gospel by public preaching or by personal witness. People have got this idea that to share the gospel, I have to be a preacher. But we're told that it's also by personal witness. Jesus said to his disciples, Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Again, this was a command given, not a request, not a will if you feel like it and you get the time. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Elton Trueblood, now that's a phenomenal name, was the former chaplain of Harvard and Stanford universities. And he put it so well when it came to the subject of evangelism. He said, evangelism is not a professional job for a trained few. But instead, it's the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. It's not just, although God, 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 God does call some of us to be evangelists, but the role of evangelism is the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. Now, if we are truly to understand the Bible, we must get this. Read with me, if you would, <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, verse 45. It's after the resurrection of Christ and Jesus appears to his disciples. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Oh, that would have been just one of the most marvelous things, wouldn't it? The Lord opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them that this one was written, that the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. So here's what I've done. I've died and I've rose on the third day. That's what the Bible said would happen. And then repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name, to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So what goes after the death and resurrection of Christ? The preaching of repentance and forgiveness. In his name to all nations. Beginning first at Jerusalem. Peter Maiden, I recommended his book last week. Was head of operation mobilization. Chairman of Keswick Convention for a number of years lives up in Carlisle. Peter said this, the story of the Bible is the story of mission. Now you would think someone who ran OM would come out with something like that, but that's biblically true. The story of the Bible is the story of mission. And Jesus made it very clear from the very beginning that the primary purpose of discipleship was the creation of missionaries. Listen to what he says to Peter. Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make, I will make you fishers of men. This was a missionary endeavor. 
that they were getting involved with. And being a disciple means that you also are a disciple maker. That's why we've called it this given at this title. And the Bible has does not bring any distinction between the two. You, you can't say, well, I'm a disciple, but I'm not a disciple maker. Actually, they both belong together. Can I suggest it's a crafty invention of the devil to convince Christians that you're the disciple and other people are meant to do the ministry? I believe the devil has duped the church today. And for some believing, well, they do that bit and I'm just a disciple. No, if you're a disciple, you're also a disciple maker. John Stott rightly said, Jesus is the light of the world. We cannot therefore keep him to ourselves. We dare not attempt to monopolize him. Christianity is inescapably and unashamably a missionary faith. You cannot monopolize Christ. You can't keep him hidden away. The Christian faith is inescapably and unashamedly a missionary faith. And you're not the only one involved in this. Actually, we're all in this together. That's why I said last week we're to be accountable to each other because we're not walking alone. Well, that sense of accountability just doesn't work with obedience. That sense of accountability works for evangelism. We're not in this alone. And, and, and we help each other. Luke chapter, four, Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. The Greek word for student there is exactly the same word that means disciple. So read that verse again. It's telling us that when a disciple is fully trained, they will just be like their teacher. If you are teaching someone else to be a disciple of Jesus, then they'll end up following what you do and just as you do it. It's that Timothy and Paul relationship from week one. He was a mentor. He showed him, he modeled not just a prayer life and a, and a study of God's word life, but he modeled evangelism to him as well. And by the way, as disciples, as older Christians who've been in the road longer, when the younger people watch us, they pick up our strengths, they copy our achievements. But sadly and scarily, they also reproduce our faults. You're not in this alone. We said in week one, there's no such thing as a lone wolf with Jesus. We're in this together. Evangelism is what we're looking at. People reaching people. And that's what we want to do. We want to reach out. We want to let other people know the difference that Jesus has made in our life. Let me explain how evangelism and discipleship work. They're like two oars attached to the one boat. When you're in the water, if you just take one oar, if you just row discipleship, you'll just go round and round in a circle. If you just row evangelism, you'll go round and round in a circle. And you'll never get anywhere. Both are essential in carrying out the Great Commission. We need to evangelize and disciple at the same time. And that's how we fulfill Christ's Great Commission. All four writers of the gospel were inspired, by the way, by the Holy Spirit to share the command of Jesus, to share the gospel. We've read it in weeks gone past, Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's a command. Matthew recorded that command. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the Good news to all creation. Luke 24, we've already looked at repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached 
in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And then John records, John 20, 21, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. All four gospel writers were inspired to emphasize the importance of being sent and the importance of going. And by the way, the book of Acts starts, Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You're to be my witness. You're to go and evangelize by public preaching or by personal witness. You're to make the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ known to others. So we've come to our first question. I want you to turn back to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. And Matthew begins that verse with a little word, go. Which literally means as you are going in your daily routine, in your daily walk, as you are going. When you're out and about. Now, as you're out and about. Well, we're not really much out and about these days, are we? Think of the people you can share the gospel with. In your job in your neighborhood, in your community, in your family. When you're going, in your daily and weekly routine, who is it that God's brought into your sphere, your circle, for you to be a witness to? You don't live where you live, you don't work where you work by accident. God has placed you there in his providence. So the question is, Who's God brought into your circle? Write the list. Who are those folk that have never heard of Jesus or misunderstand who Jesus is? Who do I have the opportunity? Is it the hairdresser? Is it the butcher? Is it the girl in the supermarket checkout that I always talk to every week? Is it the, the guy that lives next door? Is it the guy that works across the bench from me? Write a list of who God has brought into your circle, who you can pray for, so that you can win and witness to for Jesus Christ. Then we'll come back. The big question for many of us is where do I get started when it comes to evangelism? Well, start at the beginning, says the Irishman. That's the most obvious place to start and the beginning for all of us is everyone has had their life changed by Jesus that's where it all started the the time the moment we encountered Christ that's when we became his disciples so start where at the beginning let me illustrate Mark chapter 5 and verse 18 the man demon possessed who encounters Jesus Jesus sets him free And you get to verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus had radically changed this man's life. He He was now fully clothed and in his right mind. And he said, I want to follow you. But Jesus didn't let him go. That seems unusual, doesn't it? But he said to him, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has made how he has had mercy on you. Go home and tell him what I've done for you. Go home and tell him the difference I've made in your life. Go home and share your testimony. How do I share my testimony, by the way? Well, share your story of what Jesus has done for you in the three Talk about before I trusted Christ. Talk about when I trusted Christ. And talk about since I trusted Christ. Before, when, and now. Let me give you advice when you share your testimony. Keep it brief. Keep it personal. And keep it Christ-centered. Haven't we all heard people share their testimony 
and they spend 20 minutes talking about what a rascal they'd been and what a thug they'd been and, and what a reprobate they'd been. Oh, and then Jesus changed me. Thanks for listening. Amen. We're not there to give glory to the devil. We're there to give glory to Christ. So keep it brief, keep it personal, but keep it Christ-centered. And by the way, just sharing your testimony is one part of our evangelism. We must show people that we love them and we care about them. We should never make people think they're just another religious project. And frankly, there's been no better time than this pandemic to show our neighbours and show our community how much we love and how much we care for them. And as a result of that, the opportunities to share what Jesus has done for us has been just unreal. They won't care what you know until they know that you care. It's not the phrase. We need to care for them and love them. But one of the problems we have of getting started is, Stephen, I just wouldn't know where, what to say after my testimony. How, how do I summarize the gospel? How, how do I tell them about what Jesus has done? Well, first tell them about what Jesus has done for you. But what kind of gospel message do you share with them? Mark Deaver, in his book, The Gospel and Personal Evangelism, definitely well, well worth a read tells us this. I think he lovingly, brilliantly summarizes the message of the gospel for us. Let me read it to you. The one and only God, who is holy, made us in his image to know him. But we sinned and cut ourselves off from him. In his great love, God became a man in Jesus, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, fulfilling the law himself, taking on himself the punishment for the sin of all who ever turn and trust in him. He rose again from the dead, showing that God accepted Christ's sacrifice and that God's wrath against us had been exhausted. He now calls us to repent of our sins. And trust in Christ alone for forgiveness. If we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, we are born again into a new life, an eternal life with God. That's a beautiful, wonderful summary of, of Scripture and the overview of the message of the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean you go away and you learn that off pattern and the next time someone says well tell me about Jesus and then you just repeat that but let me just go off on a little tangent if I can for just a moment we must be very careful that when we come to share the message of the gospel we never weaken the message of the gospel A.W. Tozer again we must never imagine ourselves commissioned to make Christ acceptable to big business, the press, the world of sports, or even modern education. We are not diplomats, but prophets, and our message is not of compromise, but of ultimatum. Sometimes, well, if I tell them that, then they'll, they'll, they'll think worse of me. If I can't share that, so to make it more no, no, no. You and I are to share the gospel as it is. We have no right to weaken the gospel message to suit where we find ourselves. So here's a task for you. Here's a question. Uh, this takes a wee bit harder to do. In your own words, explain the essence of the gospel. We've used Mark Devers. But in your own words, explain the essentials of the gospel, the essence of the gospel. And what, I'm going to limit you, what four elements should you include? Do I start with original sin? Do I start with the cross? Do I, what four elements should you include? Explain 
the essence of the gospel in your own words. In just one short little paragraph. It helps you to think it through. It helps you to understand it through. As a great little challenge. And worthwhile doing. Do that. And then come back to us. That last task I set you is a difficult one, isn't it? And it's going to take more than maybe the five minutes or ten minutes that you... But I want you to work in that. That's why this series is, is, is designed to be a... Rather than just me preaching and you going, amen, and going home. Going, oh, I need to put this into practice. How do I do this? How do I work this? I want it to be more practical. And let's get a bit more practical. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. And I think he put it best when he said, success in witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results with God. You see, one of the things that we, we ask about is, how, how successful will I be? And we start measuring ourselves. Well, look how many people they have witnessed to. And look how many people they have led to Christ. Listen to what scripture teaches. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4. For when one says, I follow Peter, Paul, another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you can came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he, he waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. I'm not standing at the end of the day and go, woohoo, look what I did. It's the Lord who brings the fruit. It's the Lord who brings the growth. He just wants us to be faithful. God is the author of salvation, not us. God is the one who gives life to human beings, not us. God is the one who sustains life, not us. Whenever we start taking the credit for results in evangelism, we end, we're entering a slippery slope of pride and error. It's not me, it's him. Now to follow that through, Peter Maiden again says, this mission is not just to bring a verbal message to people. We have no mission without a verbal message, by the way. But our mission is more. You see, you and I are heralds of a kingdom. A kingdom we've already entered by the grace of God. We now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live the life of that kingdom. It is a totally distinctive life because everything has changed for us. Our motives, our ambitions, our interests have been transformed. See, one of the things that motivates us to evangelize is, is a changed life. As we looked at last week, as our obedience to Christ. Because I know him, and I love him, and I obey him, I want to know him more, love him more, obey him more. And in my obedience will come evangelism. Because of a transformed life, this is what motivates me. I'm no longer worried about what people think about me or what people will say about me. What motivates me is the difference that Christ has made in my life. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. I want what he's done for me, him to do for the rest of my family, do my neighbours, do for my work colleagues. That's why I want to share. Can I give some practical guidelines of how to evangelise? Some little tips. Now this is a massive subject. whole subject of evangelism, you can go on courses that last months and actually, to do a course in evangelism, to do an online course in evangelism would be really worthwhile. To read books in evangelize, evangelism would be really worthwhile. But let me give you some simple little tips. Before you start, ask God for opportunities. Pray for folk. Let the Lord guide you. 
start your evangelism on your knees. Can I also suggest that you, secondly, start easy. Gaining confidence in evangelism is important. Beginning in a difficult situation is likely to put you off. Don't go to the local um, society of agnostics or atheists and walk in and goes, I'm here to convince you that Jesus is real if you've never spoken to a soul in your life. Don't do that. Start easy. Gain confidence. Point three, don't wait until you're an expert. If you wait until you feel competent, you'll never start at all. We often use that as an excuse. Well, I wouldn't know where to start. I wouldn't know how to, I, I wouldn't be able to say the words. Share your testimony. Start easy. But start. Be flexible. Evangelism skills are different, as we are different. Use your natural gifts and your interests. Some of us are interested in certain things. Some of us are interested in sport. So you'll, you'll automatically be able to talk to folk who are fellas that, and girls who are interested in that and in that bring the, the conversation of Christ. Use your interests. Use your talents, your gifts, your natural abilities. Be flexible. By the way, practice what you preach. If you're talking the talk but not walking the walk, Folk will see it. If you talk to someone about a changed life, but they can't see a changed life in you, they won't want to know. Receive training. As I've already said, we're always still learning. Get into it. Get out of the rut sometimes of doing things the way we've always done things. I've been evangelism for 50 years, evangelizing for 50 years, and this is how I've always done it. Sometimes we dig ourselves into a rut. Ask the Lord to lift us out of that. And can I suggest, finally here, learn the art of debriefing. Talk over what's happened. Evaluate, reflect. Learn from your experience. That's why that sense of accountability, having someone, having a Paul or a Timothy or a Barnabas in your life is so important. So when you share with them, well, listen, this is what I did. And they go, well, did it work? Well, yes, it did. Well, do it again. Did it work? No, it didn't. Well, maybe try something different. Learn the art of debriefing. But what's all this outreach? What's the purpose of it all? One Peter two, verse nine. I need to finish. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him, that you may witness, that you may evangelize, to declare the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness into His glorious light. You may declare the praises of Him. All our outreach is for what purpose? The focus of our of our evangelism. Now listen carefully, is not the lost. The focus of our evangelism is all about the glory of God. It's all about the glory of God. John Stott again. Our supreme motivation in world evangelism will not primarily be obedience to the Great Commission nor even loving concern for those who do not know yet Christ. Important as these two initiatives are, but first and foremost, here's what our motivation should be, a burning zeal for the glory of Christ. For God has exalted him to the highest place and desires everyone to honour him too. The point? All our evangelism is to bring glory to Jesus. It's a command. We have been commissioned as disciples to make disciples. Maybe instead of finishing with a question tonight, we'll finish with a prayer. Maybe your prayer should be this. Lord, motivate me. And make my motives right. 
Help me share your word faithfully and lovingly. Lord, make me a fisher of me. Will you do that? Will you pray that? Will you genuinely mean that? Let's close. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have deemed us worthy to be able to share your gospel with anyone. Who are we? But Lord, we thank you that we are, because of your grace, saved by your grace. Heirs of your Son. Folk who have been transformed by the power of God. And you have placed us here to be ambassadors, to be witnesses for you and for your glory. Lord, we pray you'll help us to go in our daily walk. Lord, to share what you've done for us. Lord, help us to make disciples. Folk who will come to know that the radical change you've made in us is available for them too. Give us a love for your word. Give us a love for the lost. And give us a love for the, your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.